Okay. So this is the talk, FreeBSD coming from a Linux user. Um, while that's the actual title, it will go about BSD in general. Um, it just, I would like to introduce the fact that um, I, as a Linux user, was fairly easily welcomed in the BSD community. Um, and I would like to highlight some of the differences, um, some of the things that might need some improvement and that need to be um, maybe looked at in a different way. Um, so first of all, who am I? Um, my name is Toshan Barvani. I'm from Belgium. I have my own consulting company. Um, I'm involved in a lot of open source stuff, mostly Linux, um, as you see. Um, but also in a lot of configuration management, and that's the part where I think uh, things can improve and can help uh, getting users from other platforms um, also on the BSD platform. Um, I gave a talk yesterday about open power um, because I would like uh, free BSD, open BSD, and net BSD to be supported on open power. Um, so that's how I actually got more involved and introduced in the BSD community. So, yeah, I presume everybody knows this already, but Linux, when we talk about Linux, it's actually a kernel, and you talk about Linux distributions, um, which are basically operating systems around the Linux kernel. Um, each distribution has its own view and its own idea on how that needs to be implemented. Um, so it basically takes several packages, uh, bundles them together, and then creates a distribution. Um, typically, the Linux kernel is the same on all of them, as in it's their compiled version of it, but it's still something different. So a Red Hat uh, Linux is not the same like a SUSE Linux. Um, Gen 2 will be completely different than an Arch Linux. Um, the reason why I mention this so specifically is because one of the reasons why in the Linux world, at least, there is so little um, attention for this is because each one of these communities looks at their own Linux distribution. There is very little movement between the Linux distributions. Um, so typically, if a person becomes a Red Hat uh, Linux user, they will remain a Red Hat Linux user. OK, they will change between Red Hat and Fedora and other variants of it. Uh, but we see very little people actually jump from one to the other unless it is work mandated. So, um, so yeah, BSD is an actual operating system. Um, so we have FreeBSD, OpenBSD, and NetBSD, which are the main ones, I think. Um, and most of the other ones are derived from it. Um, now there, the, the other difference is the licensing type, which is obviously for BSD more BSD minded, while the Linux ones are GPL or LGPL, depending on, on the libraries. Um, I had a discussion yesterday with somebody on why uh, Linux is much more popular in the world than BSD. He claimed that it was because of the licensing model. Um, honestly, I don't think so. Uh, but we need to keep account with one thing. In a GPL license, which is considered what as a, as a viral license, you contribute to, for instance, the kernel. Um, if you want to make any modifications and you want to redistribute them, you are obliged to contribute back. While in the BSD world, companies can take FreeBSD, package it themselves, and don't necessarily need to provide those patches back upstream. I mean, most of them do it nowadays because they see the benefit of that, but there are several that will never do that. Um, now, has that contributed to the larger um, communities and the larger adoption of Linux? I don't think so, uh, but it's definitely something for discussion. Yes? Uh, that GPL benefit is actually missed in my uh, book <coughs> because you have um, entities like uh, GRSEC who are uh, maintaining a, a patch, uh, hardening patch for Linux. And they keep uh, basically that closed source. And they are violating the GPL, and uh, nobody can force them to stop. Well, one example. first of all, people can force them to stop, but the cost benefit is not there, most probably. I mean, 
you, you very well know legal actions cost a lot of money, a lot of lawyers, a lot of time. Uh, unless you're a big company, you're not going to do it. So, Oh yeah, by the way, if you want to interrupt me or say something, don't feel shy. Uh, the point is of having a discussion um, and also understanding how we can change things. Um, now, one other uh, factor is the vendor support. Um, so you have companies like Red Hat, like Suzy, like Canonical, which actually went out to the market and supported um, the Linux distribution of their choice, uh, the one that they obviously made. Um, in the BSD world, we don't have actual large companies doing that. We have several smaller companies, uh, but we don't have an actual large company or large entity pushing that forward. Um, and I think that's one of the other attributes why Linux today is so popular and why we have a, a Linux foundation which is trying to get all those companies to work together, which given that I need to work once in a while with the Linux Foundation, fails miserably. So <coughs> the, other, the, the other annoying part for, from, from a Linux perspective is the manufacturers like HP, Dell, IBM, and whoever else you want to put there, um, typically write that they support Linux. You will hardly find any documentation from them or any support or any testing done for BSDs. Um, so like I said from my talk yesterday, I'm trying to get open power, so IBM involved in that, uh, and Raptor Computing and other companies like that. Uh, but I mean, they weren't even thinking about this. Um, I haven't spoken to any of the other companies yet, but th the problem is if a user, an, an a normal user goes out and looks at a machine or looks at this laptop and doesn't find any documentation on how to install BSD on it, he is not going to be as likely to do that. Um, and the same in the server world. If you have a machine and the company doesn't find it, it's very difficult to convince a CIO or a CTO that we want to do it because it's going to be better. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult situation. Um, it has evolved over time, obviously. I'm giving what is now. I'm not going on how this history became. But we need to figure out ways to change this. Um, because if we do that, the adoption of BSD will be larger. I mean, I'm not expecting that we will ever become like the Linux communities. But at least it will be more adoption. It will be easier for um, smaller users also to be involved in the BSD communities. Oh yeah, and both are derived actually from Unix, uh, but I presume everybody knows that here. Uh, I'm not giving a history lesson here. I think most of you know that already. So in the title I say I'm a Linux user. Uh, actually, I'm also a developer. Um, because I started a long time ago, I used several distributions. I actually helped out in, in Fedora and in CentOS. Um, I started my own distribution. Um, and I still am quite active in communities. I've done some kernel patches. So it, I'm, I mean, I'm saying that I'm a user, but I've done much more than a normal user does. Um, and from that experience, I'm also trying to understand how to become a BSD developer and help out in, in the BSD community. Um, it's slightly different because of the differences in the actual operating system. Um, and there seems to be uh, a good reception for new people, but I feel the the fact that Linux is hyped so much, it's, it seems easier for new people to get involved. Um, and it, it might be interesting to figure out a way how we can change that in the future so that there is more hype around these type of things. Um, so why did I do Linux? Um, I got frustrated with Windows, um, so I started looking at alternatives. The first book I found in the bookstore was Suze. Um, so I bought that one, read that one. Uh, and then I moved to a whole bunch of Linux distributions. So I think I've done most of them for a while. Um, and like I said, I've done several patches. I've helped maintain several packages. Um, it's a fairly good ecosystem, so I can't complain about that. Um, there's good documentation. Um, but like I said, the I have, have done multiple of these distributions. Most users don't have that. Um, we had a presentation this morning of uh, Jitsi on OpenBSD. Um, and that person was frustrated by the fact that any answer that, well, any question he asked 
the Jitsi community was, if you're not running it on Debian, we don't care about you. And that's the attitude of many Linux users, developers. If you don't do it our way, we don't care about you. Um, I, like I said, I've been talking with BSDs about open power, and everybody has been very open, at least to discuss options with me. Um, given that I am not very well known in the community, they were all very nice and, and open. If I tried to do that within the Linux community, uh, I wouldn't get anywhere. Uh, in, uh, I mean, I came to this conference, I already spoke to OpenBSD, NetBSD, FreeBSD. Um, if I go to any of the Linux events, I don't think I would be able to do that. So it's, it's, it's still a good ecosystem, but the interactions between the distributions is very limited. People are very narrow-minded, and they only see their own distribution. Um, I feel the BSDs are much better at that. Um, at least OpenBSD and FreeBSD talk to each other, NetBSD also talk to each other. Um, I think this conference has been running for several years. That is also one way of, of looking at how the communities interact with each other. So yeah, I got involved in, in Belgium, because I live there, um, in the open source community. Um, I did some Ansible meetups. Um, I organized a small conference called Load Days, um, which when we chose the name was the Linux Open Administration Days. Uh, but I think we should rename it because Christoph has spoken there also already. So there are a lot of BSD talks nowadays. Um, conflict management camp um, I also co-organize. Um, and that one is, I think, more interesting by getting new users on the platform without having to educate them in every little detail from the beginning. So having uh, a tool like Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Salt, whichever one you prefer, and if you could just, by a few configuration changes, run the same things on BSD, it makes users very easy and comfortable to do it. I mean, those users are not going to be developers and they're not going to be able to debug problems. But at least you get them on the platform, you get them interested, and then you can make them a little bit more aware and more experts in whatever they're trying to do. Um, yeah, I helped organize a few conferences other than that. Um, my, my road to Unix is very strange, um, so in, in my consultancy business, I got introduced to IBM f for AIX. I started doing training on that, um, and then I started thinking that, okay, I mean, this is proprietary Unix, why don't I look at open source uh, Unix? Um, and that got me started on BSD. Uh, I started with FreeBSD because that's the one that I knew of, um, and Christoph being an, an, another Belgian person, I could talk to him and, and get information from him easily. Um, so that's typically uh, what, what I also tell to most of the people I know. If you know somebody else who can help you and they're using that uh, variant or that distribution, use the same because you can ask, you can talk to people, it makes it easier. Uh, so yeah, what what I also do is I have a, a consulting company, but we also do some cloud support. Uh, so we use FreeBSD because of ZFS. So all our storage machines are, are FreeBSD. All our backup machines are FreeBSD. Um, and we use internally Ansible, so uh, we actually are able to bootstrap FreeBSD from Ansible like we do a Linux machine. So for some of the other colleagues who are not always as aware of, of all the uh, things we offer, uh, they can still log in, uh, do their Ansible playbook, and stuff gets repaired uh, till I or somebody else who knows BSD a little bit better can look at it. But at least the customer doesn't suffer at that point. Uh, we use OpenBSD for all our routing and networking uh, devices, uh, mostly because of packet filter. Um, I know FreeBSD also has packet filter, but the one in OpenBSD is a little bit newer, um, so that's why. Um, so I learned to use BSD. Um, it's, I mean, if you've been long enough in the Linux world, you know the old commands and not only the new ones. Um, and so the old commands are the same. Uh, a stupid example is like ifconfig. In Linux, it's considered deprecated and you're supposed to use IP route or IP address or IP whatever. Uh, I mean, 
it doesn't make sense. There's no actual good reason for changing it. Uh, but somebody had this crazy idea. They changed it. Um, if you know the old commands, you can still use them on BSD. One of the use cases I wanted to highlight and, and something that maybe somebody can give me better feedback on is we have a whole bunch of uh, customers that run Linux on the desktop. So uh, I am fortunate not all my customers run Windows on the desktop. So we do have some customers that run, run Linux. Um, now we use Cinnamon, so that's the window manager because it looks like Windows, so uh, we don't need to help with supporting end users, like where is the button or, or how do I do stuff, because it's very similar. Um, the other reason why we use Linux is because third-party software like Citrix um, or like the Belgium EID software is only supported under Linux. Um, and this is just two examples, but you can fill in whichever one you want. Uh, typically, nowadays, if you go to software, you'll find support for Windows, Mac, and Linux. You will hardly find support for BSD there. Um, and, and for certain of these packages, companies will not take the risk of saying, okay, we can use it uh, in a different way, or we can have uh, two operating systems. That doesn't work. So um, in general, my experience has been that uh, device support is better. Uh, for most of the devices. I think that's now less uh, of a problem, uh, but that's, that used to be a big problem for newer hardware. Um, and yeah, there's still QEMU support. I know Beehive is, is there in FreeBSD and can do very similar things, um, but it's still a little bit different uh, if you're running some of the Windows workloads, uh, because some of the customers still run Windows workloads on, on VMs. Um, but then specifically locked down to that application. So yeah, in the server world, uh, it's very easy to get BSD in. We have several customers on that. Um, like I said, mostly for storage, for routing. Uh, we have some customers running Beehive. Um, and, and there the adoption has been very easy because people and, and operators don't actually see the difference. Uh, we have a customer where we have operators that try to log in and don't even know the difference. They just think they're working on an older Linux machine. Um, and, and in some of them, we even have aliases so that if they type in the Linux commands, they, they get the Unix uh, feedback on it. Um, but again, this is my specific use case. Um, I just wanted to highlight that this is possible. Um, it's it's very difficult to get beyond this stage, I feel. Um, so that's why, for instance, on the desktop, we don't get to do that. Um, on, on other workloads, we have a whole bunch of applications that are officially certified for Linux, but not for BSD. Um, and, and it's sometimes difficult for us to push that to customers, because customers will want support from their upstream vendor. Uh, and if those upstream vendors don't have any kind of documentation on what to do with BSD, it's very difficult to, to get that adoption. So that was my presentation. Um, if you have any feedback, discussions, questions. The best part is that the it's it's much more stable. So typically you have a kernel update every three weeks, four weeks in Linux. Um, in the FreeBSD, it's typically like every six months. Um, given that my laptop hardly reboots, um, so I'm mostly hibernating and, and suspending, um, that would make a big difference. I haven't personally switched to, to FreeBSD, 
uh, even though I technically could because I don't have a lot of devices that are not supported. Um, but just to be in line with some of the development we do, I am running Linux. Um, but yeah, as a desktop, I think for mm, for a little bit more advanced users, it's not going to make a big difference. I mean, I use i3 window manager. I can do that on FreeBSD also. Um, I use uh, well, Firefox, all the other stuff that works all on FreeBSD. So I, I don't have a lot of software that wouldn't work. Um, so I, I think it's it's more from a hesitation of having not to link with the, with the business then. Um, but that's personally. Uh, I think it's very easy to get certain workloads on. So you, you can, for instance, have a kiosk um, that could run FreeBSD because nobody would care and it would be much more stable, secure and easier to manage than a Linux machine. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any kiosk customers anymore. We had one several years ago, but that's typically no more the use case because people use tablets or, or other devices for that. Um, Yep. One of the biggest problems is that we're having a, a chicken egg, and, uh, egg problem here uh, because people are rarely coming to desktop BSD. There are much uh, fewer people out there with BSD knowledge that you could hire even for uh, operation stuff on servers. Um, I'm working for a company which has a mixed environment. Um, so when we get new employees on board, uh, we usually have to show them everything. Mm -hmm. And there are those who are curious and uh, like the differences or whatever, and those don't. Uh, and so actually our landscape is changing. FreeBSD is unfortunately on the decline because most of my co-workers are not interested in that. They have a Debian background or a, a Red Hat background or whatever, and they just want to do that thing, and that's it. So it's hard to get the personnel that you need for that. Yeah, and, and like you said, that's a chicken and egg problem because, I mean, unless we get people involved and interested, you're not going to get consultants from them or people who will promote it. Um, so that, that is a, a, a problem. Um, so, I mean, I spoke yesterday about Open Power. We have the same problem in Open Power. We, we have a whole bunch of machines that will come, but nobody wants to invest time in some of these new machines because they're not sure what will happen. Um, they don't, they're not sure whether they'll be able to get work. Um, so the same, I presume, will be with FreeBSD or for any BSD. If you invest your time to learn that, how much demand is there on the market for that? Um, so yeah, it's, it's difficult. Yes? You have IFTX teams for the university where I work. We have some Linux. Well, of course, some of the server Linux and for the user space, well, some of the computing students, of course, they use Linux, some of them. But, well, at the moment, I'm trying to get my new laptop on this OpenBSD or any of BSD to the network. At the moment, I can't because I've not figured out yet how to connect it to the Cisco AnyConnect with two factor authentication stuff. So I trust as long as this doesn't work, it's impossible for me to use uh, OpenBSD or whatever desktop because I just can't connect to um, from home. So it's like in in Linux they use AnyConnect, I think. Yeah, I have AnyConnect, but the two-factor stuff fails. Oh, ah, okay. That so yeah, if, <coughs> if that's the problem, and that I have not yet figured out what magic is needed. And so as long as we have all those, well, everything works. Say one bit. As long as this one doesn't work, then yeah, but it improves a lot. That nowadays a lot of stuff runs in your browser, so it doesn't care what um, underlying system you have. But there are still those little well things that work, and even if they do work, some maybe they introduce something new, and then it doesn't work, and you have to start over. So this is like uh, the browser stuff is is isn't 100% true. Yeah, so yeah, we, we have EIDs in Belgium, so the electronic identification which you put into your smart card reader. Um, and so the Belgium government is, is actually quite good because they open source the software. 
Um, so you technically could compile it for FreeBSD, but the problem is that to use that in, for instance, Firefox, you need a Firefox extension, and that one will only build on Linux. That doesn't build on FreeBSD. Now, I mean, Firefox is Firefox. Most probably there's some stupidity because of the, the driver that is working there. Um, but I mean, these are type of things where you would think, oh, it's in the browser, therefore it would be easy. It's not always that easy. Yeah. Um, but it improved. Yeah, it improved. I'm not de so denying. In Seoul, every public, we had uh, the situation when our government chose uh, EIP reader with only closed towers drivers and were available only for Windows and for Linux. And later also for Mac OS. OK. Well, the Belgium government was I think the, the very, very first one we had was also one of those closed sourced ones. Um, but those were like the test ones that they issued. Uh, once they went to the production one, which all the citizens got, it was open sourced. Um, so we, like I said, we are a little bit lucky that we can still compile stuff and do stuff with it. Uh, but it's not 100% yet. Um, and that's the same with your AnyConnect. Um, I know that AnyConnect works, but I have... Uh, there is a But does it work? Open connect server in previous reports. So I but uh, does it work with the two-factor authentication? Uh, no, <laughs> no, because we cannot do we cannot do two-factor authentication. But in fact, uh, I might try it because uh, I have explored the two-factor authentication in quite distant past. Okay, you but know, maybe maybe, <laughs> maybe the situation. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll look at it. Um, I, I remember that there used to be uh, Debian with the FreeBSD kernel, and there was a FreeBSD with a Debian user space, and, and they, they had done all this stuff in the past. I thought that was all deprecated and, and didn't exist anymore, but I will look at the, the subsystem. Uh, this is actually something different. Yeah. Uh, 
to the FreeBSD. Yeah. 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 yeah, but that might be able to help with like these. The system code, there is a Linux API kernel programming interface in FreeBSD kernel that emulates or that translates the the Linux system calls with their semantics to FreeBSD systems and their semantics to to help uh, uh, to help uh, porting uh, drivers from Linux more easily. Okay. Any other questions, remarks? Oh, well, well, I can show you one more thing uh, now that we have time. Uh, so I, I told you about the um, Ansible that we have. Um, so in this case, for instance, um, if I go to this machine, which is one of our backup machines, the only thing we need to do is basically change distribution here from FreeBSD 13 to when FreeBSD 14 comes to 14. Um, and then it basically builds our virtual machine in QAMU for us. So from, from an operator perspective, it's, it's fairly easy. Um, it builds everything up. It does everything. Um, also, if we, if I look, for instance, for um, something similar for my customers, that we yeah. will, uh, but only for jails and, uh, and, uh, and uh, customization of. Uh, so if if we look at, for instance, this one, this is how users are created. So yeah, you have some specific um, free BSD commands coming, but for the rest, it's typically just this statement to create a user. Um, now, this has nothing to do with Linux or Unix. I mean, this is just easy for a, a, a novice user to be able to do it. Um, and this is the same type of abstraction layer for Puppet, Chef, Salt, or any other configuration management tool. Um, and in that way, at least you can have uh, y users who are not always very familiar with all the subsystems still be able to use those type of machines. Okay, thank you.